you and I have a responsibility to do our best. It may not be as good as somebody else, but I have the responsibility of being my best at where I am and whatever I'm doing. There's always somebody who can outdo you, but that's not the issue. The issue, am I giving it my best? Next on In Touch, the third step, service. One of the greatest tragedies in life is for a person to live their whole life with no purpose, no sense of direction, no goals. They're just floating through life, just sort of managing to live from one day to the next or maybe from one week to the next, maybe from one paycheck to the next, accomplishing nothing really except just existing and making enough money maybe to just get by or maybe end up on the street corners as we see sometimes people out there begging for money. I look at them wondering, what happened? What happened back in their life that caused them to lose all hope, all sense of purpose, no real sense of direction in life? It's like going on a long journey and you have no GPS, no sense of direction. You don't have any destination. You're just sort of going, just sort of wobbling in life. What a tragedy. And I can tell you, no matter who you are, that is not the will and the plan of God for your life. It's very clear in the Scripture that He has a plan and a will for everyone's life. Otherwise, He wouldn't have given talents, abilities, skills. He would not have given spiritual gifts to believers if there were no purpose whatsoever. So if I should ask you what you're living for, what would you say? Would it be something to do with your family, your job, or some particular interest or hobby that you have? What are you living for? So the Scripture is very clear. And one of the most important things about our relationship to Him and our relationship to each other is the fact that God has given you and me a spiritual gift or gifts. And He's given us talents and abilities and skills. And He's given them to us for a specific reason. But if you don't know that, and you don't care, and you just want to get by, you'll miss out on life's best. So I want you to turn, if you will, to 1 Peter chapter 4, and look, if you will, beginning at this 10th verse, which is very important. And Peter's just been talking about things that are going to happen, and so forth. And so he comes down to the 10th verse of 1 Peter 4, and he says, and every word is important in the Word of God. He says, as each one has received a special gift, employ it in serving one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Whoever speaks is to do so as one who is speaking the utterances of God. Whoever serves is to do so as one who is serving by the strength which God supplies, so that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belongs the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Now look at this 10th verse for a moment and notice what he says. No unnecessary words in the Bible. As each one, not as a group, but each one, as each one has received. Each one means an individual. Has received is a tense of the verb that means something happened in the past. Not a line, but a period. At some point in your life as a believer, and I believe this comes to you, your spiritual gifts come when you trust Jesus Christ as your Savior, and the Holy Spirit begins to work them in your life at that point. At a moment in time, you received a special gift and other gifts for a very specific purpose, he says. And he says, employ it, put it to work, activate it. How? In serving one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God that is His multiple expressions of goodness and love for us, He says, as good stewards, not sloppy, not lazy, not careless, not indifferent, but good stewards of the grace of God. Now, let's, uh, let's distinguish between something. God has given to every one of us one or more gifts, so let's define what is a spiritual gift. And I'll have these on the screen here. A spiritual gift is what? A divinely given endowment that enables us or equips us to serve Him effectively and successfully. That is, God has placed within you as one of His children. He has endowed you with a very special gift. That is, He has endowed you with 
the enabling power to work in your life to fulfill His purpose, whatever that might be, and to do so effectively and successfully. So, you have a special gift. Now, what's the difference between a spiritual gift and a talent? Well, a talent is also a gift. It's a special ability that one has in some particular field and in which they can be successful, sometimes very successful. It can be one of many skills. For example, there are talents in the field of sports. You know about that. There are talents, for example, in the field of teaching. There are talents uh, in the field of cooking. In fact, you could just go down the list of all the things that people do. Some who are so technically minded. And scientists, for example, who are just way out when it comes to understanding and being able to understand and explain to others exactly what's going on uh, in the uh, heavens. So, er there are all kind of talents. But a talent is something you come into the world with. Your parents, for example, had something to do with that. But a spiritual gift is something that God deliberately, willfully chooses to give you based on what He knows your capacities are, based on what He wants to do in your life. And so, if you're a believer, you have one of these special gifts. And uh, so, let's look for just a moment at how the Scripture divides them up. Let's start with Ephesians chapter 4. And uh, Paul in Ephesians chapter 4 talks about mi ministry gifts. And if you'll notice, if you will, in verse 11 of, of Ephesians 4, he says, And he gave some as apostles, some as prophets, some as evangelists, and some as pastors and teachers. And you'll notice he puts pastors and teachers together because a pastor ought to be teaching the flock. So, these are ministry gifts. And notice what he says. He gives these gifts for the equipping of the saints, for the work of service to the building up of the body of Christ. That is my responsibility in this fellowship to build you up by the grace of God and by the power of the Holy Spirit. That is in order to work out God's will and purpose and plan in your life to build up the whole fellowship. So, I want you to turn, if you will, to 1 Corinthians for a moment. And let's look at the uh, 12th chapter of 1 Corinthians. And here are some personal gifts that God gives. And if you'll notice what Paul says beginning in the first uh, verse, now, concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I do not want you to be ignorant. And uh, then he moves on down, and he says in verse 4, Now, there are varieties of gifts, but watch this, and the, and the, but the same Spirit. It is the Holy Spirit that gives the gift. You don't get a gift from this person, that person, the other person. Spiritual gifts are a gift from God through the Holy Spirit. There are varieties of ministries in the same Lord. Uh, there are varieties of effects as a result of working these gifts but the same God who works all things in all persons. But now watch this seventh verse. But to each one is given the manifestation of the expression of that Spirit for the common good. That is, whatever your spiritual gift is, God didn't give it to you just for you. He gave it to you for the common good that is for the church, for the whole body of Christ. And then he talks about the gifts of wisdom and knowledge and gifts of healing, for example, and tongues, and people say, well, now, what about that tongues business? So, so that you won't be thinking about something else while I'm preaching, let's go to Acts chapter 2. And uh, you remember in Acts chapter 2, the Holy Spirit came at that point. Verse 4, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak, look at this, with other tongues, as the Spirit was giving them utterance, work of the Spirit. Now, there were Jews living in Jerusalem, devout men from every nation under heaven. And when this sound occurred, the crowd came together and were bewildered because each one of them was hearing them speak in his own language. They were from different countries of the world. Each person was hearing the gospel in his own language. That was the work of the Holy Spirit. They were amazed and astonished, saying, Are not all of these who are speaking Galileans? How can they be speaking all these other languages? How is it that we hear each of them in our own language to which we were born? And then he names all these different uh, places. And so, there was that kind of gift. 
Then if you'll go to Romans chapter 12, and here is uh, another set of gifts. The first one were ministry gifts, second the personal gifts that God gives, but always for the purpose of the work of the church. And then beginning in uh, the 12th chapter, beginning, if you will, in verse 4 of Romans, for just as we have many members in one body, and all the members do not have the same function, you know, all do the same thing, but many different members. We got choir members, orchestra members, teachers, and prayers, and so forth. So, we who are many are one body in Christ, and individually members of one another. Now, listen to what he says. Since we have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, each of us is to exercise them accordingly. If prophecy, according to the proportion of his faith. If service, in his serving. Or he who teaches, in his teaching. Or he who exhorts, in his exhortation. He who gives with liberality. He who leads with diligence. One who shows mercy with cheerfulness. So, here are seven different gifts. Now, listen carefully. These are motivational gifts. That is, these gifts are given to you for a specific purpose of which God wants to use you. A motivational gift is a gift that expresses itself within you that motivates you. That is, there's something about that. For example, a nurse with a gift of mercy would be highly motivated in that area, or probably wouldn't become a nurse. A teacher who has the gift of teaching is motivated to teach. A person with the gift of exhortation, which is mine, I'm motivated every Sunday to do what we do. And you could just go down the list of each one of them. And I think I could sit down and ask you enough questions in five minutes to find out what your spiritual gift is. And uh, there are people, if you talk to them about their life, they'd probably say, well, I don't think I have any. The more you talk, the more you realize there's something that underlies what they do and where they go and whom they relate to. There's some particular area that motivates them. So, if you looked at that for a moment, you say, well, which one of these could possibly be mine? And uh, you look at all of these and say, well, you know, I'm not too sure any of these are mine, because I don't seem to have any of those. Yes, you do. You can have a spiritual gift and not know it. In fact, the truth is, most people don't, because nobody's ever taught them. And they will say, well, I, I know I have a talent in this area of that. You have talents, but God has given you a specific motivational gift in order to accomplish something very specific in your life. And this is why it's a tragedy for people to live their lives, never know what it is, and wonder, well, why am I here? And if I should ask you, some of you would be honest enough to say, well, yeah, you know what? I've asked that about myself. Why am I here, God? Am I here just because I got born? Uh, did you have a purpose for my life? The answer is yes, He did. Be listen, because you may be going through a hard time, maybe most of your life's been difficult, doesn't mean that you don't have a spiritual gift. And I used to wonder about my mom. I didn't know about this at that particular time. But I finally figured out what her spiritual gift was. I know she was sweet and loving to me and so forth, but I got to thinking about, about my relationship to her and things I would see her do. I knew she loved to plant things. She wanted to see things to grow, and she just covered over those plants and made sure this, that, and the other. But one thing I remember, when one of her friends would get sick or, or somebody that was a friend of her friend, my mom, she didn't make a lot of money, but she'd send them a card or write them a little note. It's just something inside of her had to tell them that she was thinking about them and praying for them. After working 40 years in a textile mill, she was off for about two months, and then she went to a nursing home and asked for a job, and she wanted to nurse the people who were on their way to death. They knew they weren't going to get well, and they were going to live there the rest of their life and die. And she spent most of her last years, not all of the last years, doing just that, giving herself away to people who could not help themselves. My mother had the gift of mercy. And I look back and think, raising me, <laughs> she had to have the gift of mercy. <laughs> but she had the gift of mercy. You have one. You have a gift. In other words, do you find yourself 
always wanted to help somebody, and you're talking to them, and, and you find yourself wanting to encourage somebody, you see that they're down, you're more than likely have the gift of exhortation. And, or maybe you get in a situation, and you see people just don't seem to know how to put it together, and you have the gift of leadership and exhortation, sometimes they don't like that. Mercy does not want you telling them how to operate sometimes. But that's your gift. That's, that's the way you think. You think organized, because God made you that way. And the best situation in the world is when you have an employment that fits your, that fits your spiritual gift. If you are a leader, and you're way down here, and you don't, there's nobody you can talk to about anything, you're going to be miserable. And many people are miserable in what they do in life, and they don't know why. They're gifted in that area, but that's not where they're working. That's not where they're living. And I'll tell you, many people, for example, don't make it in marriage because they don't understand why the other one acts the way they do when that's their spiritual gift. And for example, let's say your wife has a gift of exhortation. And she uses it freely. <laughs> and, and the truth is, God must know you need it. And so, it, the, it's the way she comes across. And I had uh, this lady, if I called her name, everybody would know who she is. She, I was somewhere in a meeting, and she came up to me, and she said, I got to tell you something. She said, my husband and I were about to split. And she says, somebody sent us that set of tapes of yours on spiritual gifts. And she says, when I was listening to those, and he was listening to them severally, she says, I thought, now I know what's wrong. Because she was acting a certain way. She didn't understand him. He didn't understand her. And they were got to get, had to break up. When you understand what motivates you, and your husband or wife, or your children, for example, they have spiritual gifts when they're saved, and they act a certain way, and you think, well, what, what motivates them? They're motivated by the gift. Now, watch this. If that gift isn't sanctified, if it's not controlled by God, it can get you in trouble. But if we understand what the other person's spiritual gift is, then we can give them some slack, you know, give them some space, understand who they are. So these are the gifts that God has given to everyone, and the Scripture says it very clear here in 1 Corinthians, where we were reading. He says, for example, that uh, they are given for the, for the common good, which means they don't, He doesn't give us spiritual gifts for our sake, but He gives them for the, for the common good. And so, uh, but to each one is given the manifestation of the Spirit, that is how the Spirit operates, for the common good. And that means, in, for example, in a church like this, all this whole body right here in this particular group, we have all these gifts. And so, each one of us is to exercise our gift in behalf of somebody else, for someone else. And you see somebody headed for trouble, and you're an exhorter, you, you want to stop them if at all possible. You hear someone suffering, you, you want to step in when they're suffering. If you see somebody who's making a mistake, and it's because they don't know how, you want to teach them how. You know why? Because they, God made us to be a part of the whole. And if you are giving of yourself to other people, motivated on your gift, you're going to be happier, you're going to be more successful at what you do, no matter what that is. And I think when people feel that their life is meaningless, they're going to make it meaningful, even if it means to do something wrong to get recognition. So he says God has given us all of these, that is, for the, for the good of everyone, not just for the good of one person. So when I think about the purpose for which they've been given, especially, he notice he says, employ it, uh, put it to work in serving one another. So whatever your gift is, God didn't give it to you for you. He gave it to you to use you in some way for somebody else. We have all been in situations where each one of those we need. Been, been in situations where somebody needed to give you something, or encourage you, or direct you, instruct you, for example, or somebody needed to correct you because of something you did wrong. In other words, all the gifts have a part. This is about us giving ourselves away to each other. What can I do to help the other person? Because people who are always looking out for themselves, they're not happy. They're not at peace. You don't even want to be around them. Because it's me, myself, and I, and that's all they're interested in. What, what will it profit me? What will I get out of this? And that is not love, for example, and it's not the reason He gave us the gifts. And so, I look at uh, Mark chapter 10, verse 45, 
and listen to what Jesus said about Himself, and I would certainly think this ought to be our example. He says in verse 45, for even the Son of Man, and notice how He said it, even I, Jesus, for even I, the Son of Man, did not come to be served, but to serve and to give His life a ransom for many. And who was it washing feet at that Last Supper? Jesus washing feet, because He was demonstrating what service was all about. And so, the truth is, you have a very definite spiritual gift with your name on it, given to you by Almighty God. And nobody else can give it to you, and nobody else can take it away from you. The only thing you can do is employ it for the purpose of God, or waste it by ignoring it and being selfish and not living it out as God would intend you to do. And so, so somebody says, well, why does God give these things? Anyway, well, let's think about it for a moment. If He's in heaven, and Jesus seated by His right side, and the Holy Spirit's living within you, how does God get His work done? He gets His work done through His children. For example, let's say that um, here are a group of very, very impoverished children, and they have a need, and so what does God do? He stirs somebody's heart with the gift of mercy. He stirs somebody else's heart with the gift of organization, somebody else with the gift of giving, and somebody else with exhortation, somebody else with prophecy. And each one, when you put them all together, all the needs will be met. What are missionaries all about? They're all about being evangelists. They're all about establishing churches. They're all about reaching people for Christ. You have a spiritual gift, and God has given to you a spiritual gift for a specific reason, and ultimately, as He says here, for example, it is to get His work done. He's equipped you. He not only has given you a gift, He not only has given you a talent, He's given you the Holy Spirit who is His guarantee, for example, that you'll go to heaven when you die, and His guarantee and absolute assurance that He will exercise that gift through you to accomplish God's purpose in your life. That's why you can never give up. And once in a while somebody says, well, but you know, if you knew about my grandfather and my past and where I came from and so forth, so what? We've all, we've all come from somewhere. That's not where, the question is not where did I come from, where do I want to go? That's the issue. It, it's, it's what's God's goal? What is His destination? What is His will? What is His purpose? Because He doesn't give us gifts just to sit around and say, well, I have the gift of doing so and so. No. Remember what He said? He says He gives us these gifts for the common good, and we're to serve Him, and He says it as good stewards or excellent stewards which means this, whatever little I have, I am to be a good steward of it. If I only have a little bit of money, I'm to be a good steward of it. If I want more and be honest, if I want more, I work harder. I'm more diligent. I'm, I may outwork somebody else or whatever it might be. He says we're to be good stewards. In other words, look, the more truth that you know, the more truth you're responsible for. And the reason God gives you truth is to make it possible for you to become the full person God wants you to be. What is your potential? You don't know what your potential is. You have no idea what your potential is until you're tested. And once you're tested, for example, what happens? Just like people uh, in the sports field. They never know what they can do till they get in the contest. They break all kind of records, and they think this record, nobody ever break it. And somebody else comes along, and yes, they do. People are always in those areas are striving for the best. They want to be the best. Let me ask you a question. Because you're a follower of Jesus Christ, ignore what the world thinks of you. You're a follower of Jesus Christ. You and I have a responsibility to do our best. It may not be as good as somebody else. But I have the responsibility of being my best at where I am at whatever I'm doing. There's always somebody who can outdo you, but that's not the issue. The issue, am I giving it my best? God is not expecting you to be like anybody else. Not expecting you to be like anybody else. He's expecting you and equipping you to be your best at what He wants you to do while He created you and given you the gifts and the endowments of intal talents that He's given you. That's all, that's all He's expecting. And He says, you're living it out for somebody else, for the common good, for the whole body of Christ. Because if, if a person is truthful and honest and want to do their best, 
They, listen, you want God's best, not man's approval, God's best. And He's gifted you so that you can become something that you aren't, something that He wants you to be. So this is why you can't blame your past. When people say, well, if out of this, if out of this, and if out of that. Well, you know what? If out of this has nothing to do with it. In fact, some of the most famous people in the world came from the most difficult situations. That for all practical purpose, they didn't have a chance in life. But you know what? They didn't stop where they were. They didn't say, this is all I can do, and I'm going to blame it on this, and blame it on that, and blame it on the other. They said, this is where I am. I'm going to do my best where I am. I'm going to give it all I've got, and I'm going to trust God. People who make the best are oftentimes, listen, and the reason is because they recognize where they are, and they're not willing to stay where they are. You don't have to stay where you are spiritually. And so, if you think about this, these spiritual gifts and talents don't originate with us. God is the one who gives them. Now, what does He give them? He gives them for the specific purpose of making you the person God wants you to be in order that you can accomplish the things that He wants you to accomplish. Now, you can sit here and say, well, you know, that's all right if you've got this and got that. No, that's not all right. Don't underestimate what God can do in your life. Don't underestimate it. You don't have any idea what He can do in your life. He'll take you from where you are. And I can think back in my life, and if somebody had ever said, because I was very shy and uh, I wasn't a very good student, I had a lot of reasons to say, you know, I would never accomplish anything in life. You know what motivated me primarily? Well, first of all, God motivated me, number one. Secondly, I worked in a hot, terrible textile mill for two summers, and I thought, God, I'll join the French Foreign Legion <laughs> before I work in this place. And uh, you've got to get motivated. And, it, and, <laughs> and if things get hot enough and bad enough, you'll do better. But then some people, they just say, well, this is the way it is. This is my lot in life. Listen, your lot in life is to be obedient to God, to walk in His will, to will fulfill His purpose and plan for your life. God loves you. Don't stop where you are. Don't give up and quit. You say, well, I'm trying to figure this out. Don't figure it out. Just say, God, I'm your vessel. I'm available. I want you to accomplish your will in me. Whatever that is, God, I'm going to do whatever you say. Sometimes He'll miraculously open doors for you that you could never figure out. If you live on what you can reason, you'll never get anywhere. You live on what God reasons, and live on the power of God, not in your own strength and your own resources. That's why He says He sent the Holy Spirit. Now, you notice He said He's given them for the common good, everybody, and there's no room for boasting. None of us can say, here's my gift. The issue is, you are a child of God endowed with the Spirit of God, the anointing of God upon your particular gifts. That's why you've got to ask the question, God, what do you want to do in my life? What are you up to in my life? You said you have given me these talents and gifts, and I'm to obey you and to fulfill your purpose in life. That's what matters. And what matters is not what somebody else thinks. There will always be critics, and there will always be people who will love you and be inspired by what you do. The issue is, what am I living for with these gifts and talents God has given me? Or if I think I've failed at some point in life, no matter what's happened in the past, everybody's failed at something. Everybody's failed at something. You just get up and do it again and say, okay, Lord, I, I didn't understand. Oh, I blew it there. And I'm willing to do whatever you want me to do, God. You would be totally surprised what he's got in mind. So when I look at all these passages, and, and I look at uh, Colossians chapter 3 for a moment, and uh, notice what uh, uh, Paul is saying here, because he's talking about this very idea of, of doing our best at what we do. And uh, here's what he says in the third chapter. He says, uh, 22nd verse, Slaves, in all things obey those who are your masters on earth not with external service as those who merely please men, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. Now watch this. Whatever you do, do your work heartily, thoroughly, completely, enthusiastically. Do your work heartily as for the Lord rather than for men. And I think about people who 
look at their bosses, for example, and think, you're not working for him. You're working for Jesus. He's just an intermediary. You're working for God. You do your best no matter where you are. I remember when I was going to seminary, I worked in a, uh, in a grocery store, and I was a cleanup boy. That means after they got all the dirt out there and all the mess, I had to go clean it up. Well, I moved pretty fast. And um, so one day uh, I heard the boss telling somebody, he says, don't get in Stanley's way. He'll sweep you right out of here. <laughs> well, uh, you know what? I gave it my best. If I had to sweep, I had to sweep. I worked in a textile mill in a place that was next to Hades. It was so hot. It was high up in the building, and uh, in 30 minutes, you were soaking wet. That's, it. That's what it was about. I gave it my best. I said, Lord, I don't like this, but I'll stay here as long as you want me to, but I'm not too sure how long I can handle the heat. And about three weeks, God put, took me down, put me doing something else, but I would have stayed if I'd have had to. People say, mm, I can't stand this, I quit. No, you can't quit on God. Now, you say, well, did, what did God have to do with that, that job? Well, I needed to go to college. I needed to make some money. He had a lot to do. He gave me a job. And so the issue is, you don't quit, you don't give up. You remember who you are. You are a creation of Almighty God. He loves you. He loves you enough to die for you. He gave you talents and gifts and the Holy Spirit of the living God within you to equip you to do whatever He has in mind. Sometimes people quit right before they reach the goal. The biggest gold deposit ever discovered, the men who were there before, they stopped three feet from absolute indescribable wealth because they got tired of digging. Sometimes we have to keep digging, whatever that is. Listen to what he says. He says, whatever you do, do your work heartily as for the Lord rather than for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance. It's the Lord Christ whom you serve. If we could just get that, it's Jesus whom we are serving. This may be the mediator, whoever that person is and where we work, but it's the, it's the Lord whom we serve. But if I do my best at whatever I do, that's what matters. So as you think about what your spiritual gift is, what God's doing in your life, and here's what He says. Now, I'll, I'll say this quickly. We're to exercise our gifts in service to one another and in the power of the Holy Spirit. You know the Scriptures in Second chapter of Acts, the Holy Spirit came to endue all of those believers with the power of the Holy Spirit because He said to them, He said, now you've, you've listened to me and you've been with me for three years, but you're not ready. Any one of us would have said we we're ready. You're not ready until the Holy Spirit comes upon you and enables you. He's our enabler. He's the strength and the energy and the power and the knowledge and the understanding. All of us who is saved by the grace of God, have been sealed by in the indwelling Holy Spirit. That's how we know we're eternally secure. It's the same Spirit that works in our life and works through us to help us to accomplish what God wants to accomplish in life. And I think about people, for example, who retire, and, and once in a while one of my friends will call me, Stanley, when are you going to retire? I said, it's not in the Scripture. Uh, <laughs> and uh, they've already retired. And... Uh, and this is a tragic thing, and I'm not criticizing my brothers at all, but I, I know this is true. A lot of them can't wait till they're 65 years old and stop. 65 years old. Listen, I've learned more in the last 20 years probably than I knew the first 60. So, I'm more excited. I can say this. I'm more excited about studying the Word of God today than I've ever been. Now, listen to what he says. The righteous man will flourish like the palm tree. He will grow like a cedar in Lebanon, planted in the house of the Lord. Watch this. They will flourish in the courts of our God. They will still yield fruit in old age. They shall be full of sap. That means life, energy, and very green to declare that the Lord is upright. So, where is this retirement business? We are to, we, listen, we are to work as long as God gives us the energy. And listen, we are to invest our life in other people. I look at this passage in uh, the Psalm 92 and thank God you have a life for every one of your children. He takes some early in life, some later in life. 
But the most important thing is this. We want to do our best as long as we live. And He gave us the Holy Spirit to enable us and to empower us to do everything He wants us to do. Now, let's think for just a moment. Why do believers fail to serve Him and weaken the testimony of the church? Why do they do it? So, I'm going to give you a list. And uh, may, so, I won't have to take too long to discuss these. Number one, they're ignorant of Scripture. They're, they're people who have no earthly idea that God requires them to exercise their spiritual gifts and their talents. Secondly, there are people who feel inadequate. Oh, I couldn't do this. Now, watch this. When people say, I can't, they're looking at themselves from their viewpoint, not God's viewpoint, not what God said, but what they think, which makes them inexcusable. Third, they have guilt feelings. Well, I can't serve the Lord because back yonder my life, I did this, I did that, and uh, so I'm just not worthy. God's grace takes care of the past. Not acceptable. Fear of failure. Well, how do you learn some things? You, you learn by failure. How do you learn to swim? You just don't hop in the water and just take off. How do you learn to do many things? You learn by exercising the opportunity. Then, of course, people are unwilling to make a commitment. And so they'll say, well, um, yeah, I'll do thus and so. And then what happens, for example? Listen to this. If you have a responsibility and you commit yourself to that responsibility, don't show up late. Don't show up and say, well, I just didn't feel good. You didn't call anybody. Nobody else will take your place. And here's my conviction. If you take a responsibility and you can't be on time and doing what you're supposed to do, resign and let somebody that God will use who may have less talent and less ability and less skill and less, 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 but they're, but what, they're faithful, they're trustworthy. Those things, we don't, we don't, what happens to trustworthiness? And so, we are responsible to God. Then I think one of the reasons that people don't serve the Lord is a lack of love and caring for other people. They don't love other folks. Some people grew up in a home where they were never taught to love and never saw an example of love. I understand that. But you know, you can get over those things if you want to. You, listen, if you just spend your life excusing uh, yourself for laziness and trifleness and sloppiness and all the rest because, oh, my family did this, my, you know what, well, we've all grown up in bad situations about certain things in life. We, but God's gifted us. He's talented us. He's given us opportunities. We don't stay where we are. We move on in life. It may not be as fast as you want it to be, but you, if, when you're faithful where you are, and I can think of some people that it seems they only have one gift in life, but how faithful, loyal, devoted they are. And God says He's the one who gives them the, the reward. Then, of course, there are people who are selfish with their time. And as we've said before, they say, well, you know, I just don't have time. In other words, you don't, have, you don't have time to witness to somebody else. You don't have time to serve. You don't have time to sing in a choir, though you're gifted. You don't have time to play, though you're gifted. You don't have time to do this, that, the other, and so forth. You don't have time to visit other people. You don't have, time, you don't have any time to do anything for anybody but yourself. That is pure selfishness, ungodliness. And then, of course, People who are poor managers of their time. And the people who tell you, well, I just don't have time, is because they've never stopped to sit down and think, now, I've got 24 hours in a day, seven days in a week. Now, what do I want to accomplish? You have to plan it. And you don't have to be smart to do that. I learned that a long time ago in the very beginning, early in my life, that if I were going to get something done, I better write it down and decide when I'm supposed to do it and when I'm supposed to get it done. And... Uh, you may have a long list and say, my goodness, I didn't get half of that done. What do you do? You start again the next day. In other words, you, you don't give up in life. You don't give up and excuse it and blame somebody else. As long as you're blaming somebody else for what you don't have and what you can't do, you'll never make it in life. And nowhere in the Bible does it say, I have the privilege to blame my circumstances on somebody else. It doesn't say that. It doesn't make any difference where I came from. Who knows where Dry Fork, Virginia is? I was born in Dry Fork, and you know, just a few people there, and the only thing there was a mill and railroad crossing and one old grocery store, 
And that's about it, and I guess that's what life's all about. No, that's not what life's about. I'm saying to you, don't give up. Don't be where you are blaming on your past or blaming on what your grandfather did, your great-grandfather, or somebody else. Well, my grandfather was in jail, and my father was in jail. Well, don't go there. You, you, in other words, you, you, don't, you don't have to go there because they went there. That's not the issue. But that's the way people think. Now, here's one of the worst things, comparing yourself with somebody else. You know why that's not right? Number one, nobody else is like you. You look at, you put everybody's thumbprint, they're all different. I don't understand how you can have six, uh, seven billion thumbprints. I don't know how all that works. But I can say this, God knows you by name. And when you think about it, it's not right to compare yourself with somebody else. For example, as a nurse, you're a nurse and you think, well, you know, I just don't have the stamina so-and-so has, or maybe you're a secretary and you're not the best in the world with a computer. Don't compare yourself with somebody else. Here's what you do. God, I want to thank you for the gifts and talents and skills you've given me. And God, by the Holy Spirit, I am going to improve. I'm not going to stay where I am. I'm going to improve. I'm not waiting for somebody else to just give me a break. I'm going to improve by the power of the Spirit of God. And do you think God will help you? Absolutely. He promises to do so. You, you don't know what your potential is. And as long as you blame somebody else and there's something about the past where you're, you'll never make it. That, listen, everybody, in fact, if you, list, if you go through the list of history of people who have done amazing things in life, they came from crazy paths. You'd think they'd never amount to anything in life. But you know what? They didn't stay where they were. They didn't look around and say, I'll never amount to anything. They decided, I'm going to give it my best. I may not get there, but I'll give it my best. And when people get over that, then God will begin to work in their life. And of course, one of the primary reasons that people don't really serve God is they're living in sin. You live in sin. You don't have any big desire to serve God. You don't have a big desire to help other people. You're just trying to satisfy yourself. And when I think of anything that breaks my heart is, when I see people waste talent, skills, time, gifts, because of this, because of that, because of the other, when God saved them, sent the Holy Spirit living on the inside of them, and it's like he had to go to sleep. You never know your potential till you put yourself in the hands of God and say, Lord, I'm going to do it your way. And my desire for you is that you look at yourself and say, God, here's who I am today. What do you want to do in my life? Where do you want me to go? I refuse to accept the excuse that I can't and they won't. The important thing is, God, what do you want? And now that I know I have a spiritual gift and I have, I have talents and I have the Holy Spirit in me, God, I'm going to give it my best beginning today. I'm listening for direction. I'm going to trust you, and I'm going to obey you. Today could be a life-changing day in your life. It's a choice you make. If you've never trusted Jesus as your Savior, it's not going to work. You know why? The wages of sin is death. The gift of God is eternal life. And my prayer is that you would ask Jesus Christ to forgive you of your sins based on the fact that he went to the cross and died on the cross and his blood paid your sin debt in full so that you don't have to pay it. He forgives you of your sin, writes your name in the Lamb's book of life and seals you forever as a child of God. Whoever you are, wherever you are, you've just heard the truth. And I pray in Jesus' name, that you'd be willing to ask him to forgive you of your sins, tell him you've messed up your life, you've depended on other things, you've lived it the way you want to live it, you've never given him any real thought in your life about how you should live, you thought you were doing well, you're not doing well without Jesus. You're going to reap what you sow, more than you sow, later than you sow, you cannot change it. My prayer for you is that you'd be wise enough to receive Jesus Christ as your Savior. You have the privilege of getting further along in life, if you're willing to put your trust in Him, ask Him to sanctify your thoughts, surrender your will to Him, and tell Him, Lord God, I'm going to give it my best with your, with your help and strength. Whatever you want to do with me, fine. I'm going to give it my best. 
you'll be surprised what God can do. Now watch. You can walk out of here and try to forget everything you've heard, but you will always be accountable for this message. You'll always be accountable for it because it is the truth. And it is a message preached in love and concern for you to become the person God wants you to be. It has nothing to do with me. It has to do with what God can do in your life, if you will allow Him. Amen? Amen. Father, how grateful we are for Your love for us. How many times we have to ask You to forgive us for not living up to what we know is the best we could do. Please, Lord, do not allow us to be satisfied with anything less than holy living and holy giving of ourselves to You to be used by You any way, every way You possibly can. I pray that You'll seal this message in the heart of every single believer. Do not let it escape them, Father. And I pray for somebody here today who is unsaved. They're already wasting time. Help them to see the first step is to be saved. The second step is to surrender themselves to You and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And the third step is to say, Yes, Lord, here am I. Use me. Send me. I'm available. And that's our prayer this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. As believers, we're called to use our spiritual gifts in service to one another in the power of the Holy Spirit. At InTouch.org, learn more about what it means to follow Jesus and be a blessing to others. There you can see today's message, The Third Step, Service, along with a library of free and inspiring messages from Dr. Stanley, sermon notes, and resources to help you discover God's plan for service in your life. Download the InTouch app to take the teaching of Dr. Stanley on the go or follow us on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter. the drill? I'm with you, buddy. Okay. Money, relationships, faith, employment, theology. If you've got tough questions, Dr. Charles Stanley has biblical answers in his Handbook for Christian Living. This comprehensive reference is your go-to guide for both the little gray areas and puzzling matters of doctrine. Practical, scriptural, and easy to use, Charles F. Stanley's Handbook for Christian Living is the book you'll turn to again and again. Order the Handbook for Christian Living at InTouch.org. Nearly 2,000 years ago, the Apostle John recorded Christ's great unveiling, Revelation. God's climactic story of hope fulfilled, warning, the day of wrath and judgment. Blessed are those who will live forever in the new heaven and earth. Life Principles to Live By Dr. Charles Stanley's exploration of the 30 foundational truths that continue to guide his life and ministry. Order a box set on CD or DVD at intouch.org. Share a personal message on a beautiful note card from the lens of Dr. Charles Stanley. Enjoy six nautical designs featuring boats from around the world in this 18-card set. This world will pass away, and in its place God will provide a new heaven and a new earth. And in this wonderful future, believers in Jesus Christ will enjoy such fullness and joy that it is impossible to picture it. And because of this, we pray, come Lord Jesus. And yet the Christian is also called to live a productive life in the here and now, to live as both salt and light in this present world. So how do we find the right balance between living now and longing for eternity. Let's talk about that as we read today's email question. 
Is it right to pray for God to change the direction of the world? If the world is set for destruction and God is in control, shouldn't we see the nearness of the end as a good thing? Well, the nearness of the end will be a good thing for those of us who are believers. But now, let's think about something. By the world, what do we mean? The world system or the people in the world? In 1 John chapter 5, verse 19, the Scripture says, The whole world lies in the power of the evil one. We're talking about the world system because all of us do not lie in the power of the evil one. In 1 John 2, 15, he says concerning this world system where we live, he says, don't love it, nor the things that are in it. So let's distinguish for a moment the people from the system. When the Bible speaks of the world, the Bible oftentimes refers to the system, the governments, how worlds operate, wars and economy and all those things. And so that's the, that's the system in which you and I live, but we're to live above it and not to be like it. And so when you come to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, he says, In whose case the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving, so that they might not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of Almighty God. So there is a difference between us being a part of the world. He says we are not to be like the world, we are not to partake of it as the world system operates. We are to live above and beyond that. Christ came into the world, the scripture says, to save sinners, not the system. Revelation 21.1, the scripture says, we'll see a new heaven and a new earth. Truly, it's useless to pray for God to change the world system because he hasn't promised to do that. And we live above the world system as believers, following the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why we have conflict. That's why we are persecuted, because the system doesn't accept the gospel of Jesus Christ. We're to pray for people to be saved. And the Great Commission was all about it. Jesus said he sent us out, and he sent them out for the purpose of sharing the gospel that changes people's lives. Now, if enough people got saved, the world system would collapse and we would be in charge. It's not going to happen. The Bible never promises that. The nearness of the end is a great thing because that means heaven is closer. But the real issue is this, readiness. That's the main thing. Are you ready for the coming of Jesus Christ when he takes care of all of this that's beyond our comprehension? We're thankful you've joined us today, for in Touch. And as we close, remember this. Trusting God means looking beyond what you can see to what God sees. Leading people worldwide into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ and strengthening the local church. In Touch with Dr. Charles Stanley is a presentation of In Touch Ministries. This program is made possible by the grace of God and your faithful prayers and gifts.